Okay, yeah, a couple quick uh, uh, short announcements. Um, we haven't taken a registration of everyone here yet. Uh, we want to be able to do that. So if you haven't registered and, and paid your $10, we'll, we'll take care of that around the meantime. Uh, John's probably going to head that up. Uh, also, uh, if you registered and paid and all that stuff, you still need to check with John so you can get checked off on the list. At that time, he's also going to give you a raffle ticket for our uh, raffle at the uh, end of the day. So you want to make sure you hang around for that. There's always some good prizes, uh, and that should be kind of fun. So let's go ahead and move on to the next presentation. Martin Boss. Uh, Martin is Principal Security Consultant for Acuvant Labs Attack and Penetration Team uh, with multiple years of experience in information technology. Martin specializes in black box penetration testing, social engineering, physical security testing, and red team engagement. I thought you didn't like the red team. I don't, but they make you put that shit in your bio. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Martin is the core developer of Kali Linux Project uh, and one of the founders of DerbyCon Security Conference held in Louisville, Kentucky uh, annually. Uh, everyone put their hands together. Martin. Uh, All right. Thanks for that great introduction I wrote. <laughs> no. uh, anyway, so like I said, I'm Martin. And... Uh, I'm super uh, glad they asked me to talk here. Um, what uh, when uh, Robert first contacted me uh, about talking here, he had mentioned that um, perhaps uh, maybe I could do a talk about uh, explaining the new uh, Kali Linux. And so, uh, if nobody knows what that is, uh, that's what I'm going to talk about and and uh, how we got there. If, if you already know all about it and what it is, this might be boring. Sorry, but anyway, so. We already went over this. This is kind of just a little bit about me. Uh, the only other thing that's not in my bio is that is, uh, me and my partner Alex do have a website, questiondefense.com. Uh, it's just uh, technical questions, technical answers. Uh, it's not totally security related. It's uh, basically anything. We try to write an article every day just about any IT problem. Uh, there's really complex password cracking stuff on there. There's uh, really stupid stuff on there like I can't update my iPhone. Uh, so, But it's for everybody. Uh, and if you want to contact me, there's the, uh, I'm on the Twitters and my uh, email address, if uh, that I spelled wrong. It's actually supposed to be Cali.org. <laughs> Oops. All right, so who's heard of Backtrack? Awesome. So Backtrack was a penetration testing distro uh, that uh, originally started between, uh, I'll give a little bit of a history lesson. So years ago in 2005, uh, there was a couple uh, penetration testing distros and live CDs had just gotten really big at that time. Um, the way that Wax came about was uh, Mutz, which is our founding member of Backtrack. He uh, was on an engagement in a government organization and uh, when he got there they said, no, you can't bring your computer in here and uh, then he said, well, can I just install some of the tools I need on your computer? And they said, no, you can't touch any of our computers either. And so they were sort of in a pickle at that point. And so at, at that point, Nopix and the whole live CD thing had just gotten really big. So what they ended up doing was he gave the people at the government installation a list of tools. And what they would do every morning was they would burn him this live CD and he would use the live CD to work all day. And then they would destroy it before he left to make sure that he didn't take any information back and forth and so every day he was adding more tools and stuff that he wanted and at the end of the engagement he was like wow this is pretty cool I could use this on everything and so he ended up starting uh, it actually started out as WAPIX which stands for White Hat Nopix and then merged into WAX which stands for White Hat Slacks obviously so a little history lesson and then there was another gentleman named Max Moser from Germany who had the auditor security collection anybody in here ever use auditor couple people you guys are old no. <laughs> so uh, then there was the auditor security collection uh, there was actually one more gentleman that was an original founding member and uh, his name was Martin Munich and so we used to uh, affectionately refer to them as the three M's back in the day and uh, that project was sponsored by a website called uh, remoteexploit.org uh, it's still there uh, run by Max Moser they still do a lot of research stuff um, anyway so a little bit of a history lesson this real quick I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this but this is just sort of a timeline so you can see how long backtrack has been around uh, our first release was on February 5th 2006 which was the version 1.0 beta 
Uh, I started with the project uh, in 2007, which is when Backtrack 2 Final came out. And then we had all of this stuff. What you can see here, what's important about this is you can notice around the Backtrack 4 and the Backtrack 5 time, we started to come out with a lot of R2s, R1s, R3s, and all that kind of stuff. And the reason for that was because of the way that we had the distro set up, which we're gonna talk about a little bit, uh, uh, or the reason for the move to Debian, because of the way we had the distro set up, it was really difficult to uh, streamline updates. And so, uh, like your popular Linux distros, you can do app get update or app get whatever, and it pulls down the new kernel and the new version and all that stuff. We were never able to uh, get all the pen test tools working right and be able to do that all at the same time on some of the platforms that we were using. Um, we've been on several different platforms, Slacks, you know, Nopic, Slacks, Ubuntu, and then uh, now Debian. So we had a lot of criticisms uh, about Backtrack. Uh, they're not all here. Some of them were nonsense. Oh, yes. Um, could you explain how you set everything up and how it was backed up? Sure. So uh, <laughs> kind of a funny story. So uh, originally I got involved in computer security kind of like a lot of people. Um, I did not go to school for it or anything like that. I used to be a sound engineer and I would be on the road all the time and at that time uh, there was a, 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 people were just starting to protect their Wi-Fi access points. You know, there were years when they were open and people, and we would go to these uh, venues to play and they would always have protected access points. And so originally I got into security researching, like a lot of people do, how to uh, get into protected Wi-Fi access points. Not because of the, I wanted to do anything wrong, but I just wanted to have internet on the road, right? And so I ended up getting involved with it and I met Mutz and I became a moderator on the forums. Um, he taught me pretty much everything I know about Linux and uh, became a developer shortly after that. So probably not the same career path as a lot of other people, but that's how I got there. Um, so these are some of the key points of criticism on Backtrack. The main one was that we were not FHA compliant. So uh, anybody that uses Linux on a regular basis probably knows what FHA compliant means. Uh, if you don't, uh, Linux has what's called a file hierarchy standards, which basically means that the root level file system must be a certain way and if you add a directory, the entire Linux community will shun you forever. And so basically what we did, anybody that knows Backtrack, is we added our own uh, slash pen test directory in the root. We did that in order to uh, organize the tools better so that people could go to the folder of the task that they were wanting to perform and see all of the tools that uh, related to that. The I'll talk about some more problems with that. But the main criticism was that we weren't compliant with that system. Um, there was a couple other things. Um, there were a lot of outdated tools and tool dependency issues because of the file system hierarchy standard, because things weren't, so in Linux, when you install something, it installs the libraries in the correct place and it creates the links for you. But when you put your tool somewhere completely different, that means that you have to manually create those links to the libraries. And when you're talking about three, 350 tools, it can turn into a disaster, I promise. So there was also some slow updating of getting subversion tools. I'll talk about that too, but there's a lot of tools that update all the time, like every day. And so we didn't have a really good way to automate the updating of those tools, right? So we would have to manually do it. And I don't know about you, but get yeah, like, I would build as much stuff as I could, but it's difficult to update something like uh, SQL map or something every single day, right? So it was difficult. So there was that. We had a lot of complaints about it being based off Ubuntu. You can call it the new distro or whatever, but uh, we chose Ubuntu because it works. It works better than any other Linux distro. Uh, the downside is it has a lot of restrictions that the developers put on it and they put a lot of nonsense on it. So for people like us that totally customize a distro, it was extremely difficult to work with Ubuntu. The other problem is, and I'm not bashing Ubuntu because I think it's a great Linux distro. The other problem is, is that they uh, upstream Ubuntu is totally unreceptive to bug reports from people that aren't Ubuntu developers. So we submitted tons and tons and tons of fixes for their stuff and they never implemented any of them. So we were not happy about that. Um, ARM devices, we did have support for ARM devices on Backtrack 5, but our build, uh, our build machine was a Motorola Zoom. So uh, that was all we could afford at the time. I don't know if anyone's tried to uh, buy an ARM compiler, but they cost an arm and a leg. And so, uh, so we didn't have that. So 
Uh, and we abandoned that uh, after a while, um, even though there's a lot of uh, arm doing, and we'll talk about that. And then the other big problem was that people always wanted a different desktop. They wanted to be able to build their own image. They wanted to be able to, uh, companies would say, well, I only need these tools and I only need these tools. We also had a lot of government install, uh, installations that said, we can't use your stuff because of several reasons. One, we weren't GPG signing our packages. And then two, they wanted to be able to build their own uh, distro so that they could say, yes, we vetted this, we built it, all the packages are GPG signed, this is secure, we can use it in our government installation. So, yes. Is it open software? Yes. Okay. So, we follow the Debian standard, so what we do is we have the different directories. So, we have the main directory, which contains all of the source, free open source tools, you know, all of that stuff. Then we have the same as Debian and Ubuntu, we have a non-free, which is tools that don't contain the source or, or are just binaries or whatever restrictions the developers may put on the tool. So those all go into non-free basically. All right, so uh, when we were talking about Backtrack 6, uh, the development team's pretty small, I'll go over it, but when we were talking about Backtrack 6, what we did was we all made a wish list of the things that we wanted to incorporate into Backtrack 6, right? And we wanted to do we wanted to really like come out with something new because at that point for Backtrack 4 and 5, we were just adding some tools, changing the wallpaper, all that kind of stuff, right? It wasn't really like uh, anything, you know, anything shocking. And when a new version of something comes out, you want to do something really cool. But there's only so many tools. There's only so much stuff, right? So, uh, so what we did was we thought about, you know, where else can we take this? Uh, we were on a four-year-old development architecture, which is Ubuntu 10.04. That's the other reason that I don't like Ubuntu. I feel like they come out with too many versions too quick that don't work with old versions, right? So, like, I'm not a big fan of that. So, like, I like the Linux distros better that, like, CentOS, Red Hat. I, I don't mind if they use older packages as long as they're patched correctly, right? And that's on, you know, that's on us to apply the security updates. But, you know, like, I, I kind of like older stuff that works sometimes rather than, you know, I'm a big advocate of CentOS for web servers, right? So it may be old, but it's all patched and works. Anyway, so here's some of our developer wish list, right? We wanted to be able to streamline the kernel updates. That was the biggest thing. Um, we were not in a position to build a new kernel and send it down. Uh, properly. The main reason for this was our own fault because of the pen test directory and all kinds of other stuff, right? Not following the file hier hierarchy standard created a lot of issues. It also created 10 times more work for us. Um, but we also wanted to move from subversion to get. Uh, we were using subversion at the time and we were also uh, not fully giving out every single piece of source of our stuff. So we had kernel patches that weren't in the subversion tree, that kind of thing. So we wanted to go fully open source with any patch. We write a lot of patches for other people's tools to make them work for our standards. And so uh, slowly over time, we wanted to make all those patches available. Uh, and so we used to try to, sub and there was a time when we would try to submit all those patches and then they wouldn't take them, then we gave up, Then, but we wanted to go back to that. And so I'll talk about that in a minute. We wanted to be able to GPG sign all our packages. They're signed by the developer's GPG key and they're also signed by the BuildBot's GPG key. So. So that makes it a little bit more secure. We wanted to bring back ARM support because there are so many uh, ARM pen testing devices. I'm gonna talk about that. We wa uh, wanted to rebuild our entire uh, internal infrastructure. That's our internal network that we build all this stuff on, right? It was getting old, we were using Subversion, like we were using Redmine for bug tracking and nobody was really using it because it was all complicated. And so we wanted to do that. We wanted to keep the Dragon. Everybody loves the Backtack Dragon. And so the main thing we wanted is this FHS compliance, right? We wanted all the purists of Linux to quit crying. So we scrapped it all, right? Started totally over. And that's basically all that we did. The only thing that we probably kept from Backtrack 5 is the tool list, right? And the, yes? No, so this is just last year. This just came out on March. Uh, yeah, so I can go back to the timeline later if you want to look. But so we've had uh, five backtrack versions, several revisions. And then so last year at the beginning of the year uh, is sort of when all this started. This was about a year in the making. And we released it in March of this year at Black Hat Europe. That's the other reason for this talk is uh, we realized that we no, none of us ever did an official talk about the release of this. So like this is, this is it. <laughs> so... Uh, Anyway, uh, 
So massive restructuring of the internal network, right? And so that that is important because that's where you update from, right? Those are our repositories. Those are our, uh, you know, our source trees, our bug tracker, all that stuff that the community, you know, our forums, all of that stuff that the community uses, like, uh, those are all things there. And so while that doesn't have anything to do with pen testing, I guarantee you the user experience is really important, right? If you can't update your stuff, it's anyway. So the big question, Ubuntu versus Debian, right? Uh, I don't want to get into a bunch of like distro politics because they're both good distros. I just want to highlight some of the main reasons that we moved from Ubuntu was some of the new stuff that they were implementing to make it more user friendly, right? So Unity and Mer was the main thing, right? They're going to a totally different X Windows system type of thing. And, and uh, because of all the tools that depend on, you know, GUI tools that depend on the old stuff, there was no way we were messing with that. Uh, this whole stuff you can't remove, like the Ubuntu One Cloud, their new software management thing. And that stuff's probably great for like new users or people transitioning from Windows uh, to Linux or whatever. There's nothing wrong with any of that stuff. It just doesn't work for a pen testing distro. So it had to go. And uh, also, uh, you know, Ubuntu is basically based off Debian. So uh, Debian's a little bit more of a stable platform. It has a little bit more of a, uh, what I like to call the old Linux gurus, you know, back Debian. And so we looked into like their process of becoming a Debian uh, package maintainer which is extremely difficult. I mean, like they do like person to person interviews and all this stuff, like just to be able to maintain one day be a package. So we like that. The other thing that we really liked is that they are receptive to bugs. They actually say thanks and implement them when you send them to them, right? So uh, we did have a couple of challenges. Uh, Georgia was just complaining about this. Uh, lots of people have classes and training and stuff based on Backtrack, right? It's been the number one pen test distro for a long time. And so even, uh, you know, Mutz's company, our sponsors, Offensive Security, all of their training is based on Backtrack, right? So we wanted to make sure that um, we, we uh, made as little a transition as possible uh, into that, uh, you know, while still fulfilling our wish list. So that was a big deal. And then people were always asking, is Backtrack 5 still supported? No. <laughs> so the reason for that is there was no reason to support it, right? It, it still works. I mean, none of the tools are getting updates or anything like that. But there was no reason to support it. We wanted to focus all our efforts on the new thing. Uh-oh, better hurry up. <laughs> so everybody wants to know why we uh, did a new name and didn't just call it Backtrack 6. Uh, basically because, like I just talked about, we scrapped everything. And so we thought it justified a new name. Then everybody wants to know what Cali means. If you look on the internet, it means all this cool stuff. Uh, that didn't have anything to do with the name. We actually just thought of it and then looked up what it meant. So there's nothing at all in the name except for it sounds cool. <laughs> so uh, the same core development team, right? The same people that were at the core of the backtrack development process are still involved in this. So it's uh, Mutz, Dookie, me, and then Crossbower. Uh, he's Italian. And then we got a couple of more people. Uh, the main thing that we did is we brought on this guy, Raphael. And so he is not a pen tester. He doesn't, but what he is is a Debian consultant. And so we uh, had him come on and he completely, he works on several Debian packages. He's a maintainer. He works on the core. He does all this stuff with Debian. And so who better than to come over and help us build our environment right from scratch? Something that we learned from Backtrack 5 was uh, when three people decide to build an Ubuntu development environment that have never used Ubuntu before, it's not good. You know, none of us used, I used Gen 2, Mutz used something else. None of us used Ubuntu when we decided to go to the Ubuntu platform, right? So we rebuilt our dev environment several times, and so we wanted to avoid that. So we brought in somebody that knew what they were doing. So Raphael is awesome. He helps us fix all our packages, like that kind of stuff. And then one of the guys that works at Acubot, uh, Eric, came on too. All right, so what did we change, right? So these are a couple of the small things that we changed. Uh, we removed a bunch of stuff. One of the things that was a problem in Backtrack 5 was we didn't really have a tool vetting process, right? People would say this tool is cool, and we'd be like, oh, that's cool, and we'd add it, right? And like there wasn't a whole vetting process where we could say, 
Is there something else that already does this? And so tools would get added because one of our friends wrote it or it was cool, we saw it at Black Hat or like, uh, or whatever, right? And so what happened was our repository was getting real big. We couldn't decide what tools should be on the default install and which one should app get. And so there was a lot of tools that just don't work, right? And a lot of the ones we removed were great tools like five years ago, right? But like they're not even like, you know, like valid anymore, right? Like those devices don't exist or the Perl libraries it needs don't exist or it was Python 2 point something a long time ago, you know, or whatever. So we removed a lot of stuff. Um, this is minor, but we've always had people complain about VLC running as root. And so we got that going for them. We greatly in increased the Bluetooth support to support all the Ubertooth devices. All of this stuff is compiled for that uh, in advance. Lots more wireless support. Uh, our main user base is probably wireless with Backtrack and Kali, so we like to cover as many wireless devices as possible. Um, there weren't a whole ton of new tools that we added. There were some. The only one I could think of off the top of my head when we were writing this presentation that's actually super cool is the uh, iCat, which is a kiosk attack tool. Uh, Nobody knows about it, it's super awesome. You know when you go to a kiosk, basically all you have is a web browser, right? They, they take away everything. Well, this is a, uh, a uh, web server that you can set up and you can browse to it with the kiosk and it will conduct a, a, all kinds of attacks on the web browser and get you access to the kiosk. Uh, I've probably used it 10 or 11 times. It's probably worked 10 or 11 times. Um, Another main thing we did was uh, accessibility improvements. We had a couple of blind pen testers uh, contact us right after we released Cali, and they were like, this sucks, we can't use it. And we were like, why? And they were like, we're blind. And we realized that um, we didn't even know that the accessibility, you know, we had never had anybody ask, right? So we never even made sure that worked. So, uh, so uh, that was something cool. You know, I don't know how many, you know, uh, uh, blind or hearing impaired or whatever pen testers there are, however, it works. And uh, something else that we never got working properly was full language support. So now when you select install in Chinese, it actually works. So some other new things. Uh, we always had a complaint that you couldn't install from the boot menu. Anybody that knows Linux uh, really well knows that a normal distribution, as soon as you put the disk in, you can install either graphical or live from the boot menu. So we always uh, had to take Ubuntu's installer and hack it up and make it do what we want. I don't know if you ever installed Backtrack, but if you notice it goes step one, step two, step three, step seven, because we uh, cut out all those internal steps, right? So we always had to hack up their installer. And so uh, something that was cool was we got all of this going and Raphael helped us do this. Uh, and this may not seem like a big deal to everybody. Yes? I was just gonna ask, does it install on VWare, VMware and stuff like that? Yes, absolutely, it does. Did you not get that working? Oh, no, that's no problem. Oh, yeah, yeah, so it installs. Uh, I'm just gonna highlight, people might be going, this is not a big deal, but uh, it is a really difficult to hack up one of these installers to install as only root, I promise you, uh, because most Linux distributions install as a user, right? But we uh, run Backtrack as root, so we had to make this so that it didn't ask you about installing a user and it only installed in root, which is difficult. So, we went to the Debian Wheezy base, right? Wheezy is the newest version of Debian. A uh, couple reasons for this. Once again, I don't want to get into distro wars. I just love Linux, you know, whatever. But uh, uh, Debian has a lot lighter system requirements than Ubuntu does, right? People say Ubuntu's bloated and a big giant, whatever. You know, that may be, but <laughs> Debian is a, a lot lighter system requirements. The reason for that is, is that we want to keep the live CD feel, right? We want people... Although most people install this and run it on their computer and, and, and nowadays in the days of, you know, 16 gigs of RAM and quad core processors and all that nonsense, it's not as critical. However, there are times when I break in somewhere and, you know, all they have is Pentium 4 computers because it's in, you know, Saudi Arabia or something and I need a Backtrack Live CD and I want to be able to put it in and I want it to work. I only want it to need a gig of RAM if, you know, I'm not going to be running any giant applications, but I want it to work, so... Um, backwards compatibility. Everybody's really familiar with AppGet. We wanted to stay with AppGet, right? Moving to an entirely new package management system was just going to confuse everybody. And so we wanted to stay with AppGet. We knew how to build packages. We knew our repositories were sort of set up for that. Um, we also wanted to, uh, it's easily customizable, right? Debian has a whole bunch of bleeding edge repos. Uh, and the reason that for that is because 
What happens is somebody comes out with a pen test tool and it needs some type of bleeding edge library, right? And so Ubuntu is quick to put those things into production without a lot of testing. Yeah, so anyway, so uh, so that wasn't really an issue, but what the issue was with Debian is, is uh, they like to keep their base nice and solid and working, right? And so then they have experimental repos. So the reason that worked for us is because what we can do is we can pull the package from the experimental repo, we can uh, make it suit the way that we wanted to, and then we can put it in our repo and overwrite the Debian library if we need to. So it was really easily customizable for us. Um, the other thing that we wanted to do is we actually did not want to change the desktop experience all that much, right? We wanted to change everything under the hood, but we wanted the user who was familiar with Backtrack to still be able to boot it up and get pretty much the same experience, right? Dragon, menu bar, gnome, the whole nine yards or whatever. And the Debian Weezy base is a lot smaller inside. Another big complaint we had was that the Ubuntu Live CD was like four point something gigs and it barely even fit on a DVD, right? And so, uh, Debian is down to like 2.2, back to 2.2. It still won't fit on the CD, but it's a lot smaller. Um, I'll just go over this really quick. This is some of the technical infrastructure that we rebuilt, right? So we uh, rebuilt everything to be Debian compliant, exactly like Debian does it. We used all of the same tools. We used all of the same stuff. The ISO images are built with live build. Every bug fix that we create or that we get from the community, we actually submit to Debian if it's a Debian package. Um, we move to Git and the repositories are managed with Gitolite, which is all SSH key based stuff, GPG signing. So, um, and this is just some other stuff. We synchronize our mirrors with Debian four times a day to get security updates. So uh, every time there's a security update from Debian, um, within several hours, it'll be available on our distro. That was another big deal. And then our ARM build Debians, right? So uh, Offensive Security actually forked out the money for this uh, Calyx and uh, ARM build bot, right? So it builds the images really quickly. And it can build the, uh, the uh, ARM EL and the ARM HF images. And I'll show you that in a minute. Another big thing, Metasploit integration. So uh, Traditionally, Metasploit has, uh, the Rapid7 guys have created a binary installer. I'm sure at least some people in here have, uh, have uh, installed Metasploit. It's one of the biggest pen testing attack frameworks that there is. And so it's a pretty big deal. Everybody uses it. I use it all the time. And, uh, but the problem was is that they didn't really support anybody's distro. They said, we have a binary installer. Here it is. Good luck, basically, right? And so you would have all these database issues and stuff. So uh, we contacted them and we were like, uh, you know, it was our biggest headache. And so we contacted them and we were like, look, what can we do to fix this, right? And they were super into it. Rapid7's an awesome company. They said, tell you what, we'll create our own Debian packages uh, ourselves and we'll create our own Debian repository. We'll run our own big bug fixes. We'll basically do everything for you and we'll take care of it. And so, uh, you know, and then there was some, you put your logo here, I'll put my logo here, nonsense or whatever, but basically it's official support, right? So this is the big thing is that now there's an official Debian package that's built to work on Kali Linux, everything works out of the box and there's no more uh, database nonsense or library nonsense or any of that kind of stuff. The other cool thing is that if you do find an issue with that package, they have a bug tracker on Metasploit, you write on there, and they have an entire development team that actually gets paid, unlike us, to fix that kind of stuff, right? So it gets fixed really quickly. Uh, also, uh, you do not uh, have to update MSF update or whatever you have to do or whatever. Now when you have to get updated, updates Metasploit for you. Biggest question we ever have, what happened to my pen test directory? <laughs> So basically, like I already talked about a little bit, the pen test directory was a violation of the file system hierarchy standard, right? You are not allowed to add a new root directory to Linux and have them, you know, that basically the purists were saying this is not Linux because it's not right, right? It has an extra directory. Now, when Backtrack was a lot smaller and we were just a bunch of hackers, like, you know, building tools and using it or whatever, we really didn't care, you know, but there was a point when we're like, hey, we need to turn this thing from a live CD into a full-fledged distribution. And the reason for that was is that even though we recommend against using it as your desktop OS, there's tons of people that do. I go places everywhere and people are 
you know, using it with open office and mail and all kinds of nonsense, running as root, you know, or whatever. So since people are going to do that anyway, we decided to try to make it a little bit better for them to do that, right? Whatever. Anyway, so uh, other problem. It was difficult to locate tools, right? And, and the reason, I, like, I've never experienced this a lot. The reason is, is because I've built a bunch of those tools and I know where they're at, right? But I started to think about, you know, like, if you don't really know where those at, and the reason we did that was to make it easier to find them. But what we realized was that the majority of people are using the menu anyway, right, to find the tools. They're not CDing directly to the directory unless, you know, they already know where the stuff is. Me, I do that. But the majority of people use the menu. So we decided if the menu is set up properly with everything in the right sections, then the need for the pen test directory might go away. And then the other reason was is because... Uh, tools to be in the path, right? So now when you type the name of your tool, it comes right up, whatever directory you're in. That's how the path works, right? Uh, and so we were never able to add a path to the pen test directory. At one time, we tried to put every pen test folder in the path. Not a good idea. So uh, basically now everything's where it should be. Bin, USR bin, USR lib. This makes all of our library and dependency headaches a whole lot better. Um, and so that uh, dramatically simplifies the development process. Yeah, that's good for me. The reason that's good for you is that we can build more packages and update more tools and it doesn't take us as long to actually do this stuff because we're not fooling around with, I mean, I don't know if anyone develops in Linux, but I mean, like if you got a program that needs eight libraries and none of them are in the path because you've got it in the pen test directory, you've got to make a sim link to every single library and then you got to do all this nonsense. And so we've cut all of that out. So this is a hard transition for some people. A lot of people are really, really used to the pen test directory, but I don't have anything to say, but suck it up, really. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, the next big thing that we changed is the bug tracker. And I know like this is not really all that cool. Everybody's seen a bug tracker. The reason that I put this slide in there is I really, really, really want to iterate that uh, nobody on the Backtrack project gets paid. Everybody has a real job and wife and family and kids and all that kind of stuff. So basically we don't have all day to chase down every single issue on the distro. So it's what we call community driven, right? It's only as good as the community puts into it. And so that's why I wanna highlight the bug tracker and all of these uh, issues that what happens is, and I see this all the time, is that a lot of people, you go out on a project, you boot up backtrack, something doesn't work, you throw in a you know quick one-liner to fix it and you go on with your work and then it never gets submitted and it never gets fixed, right? Then you get on IRC and complain about how Backtrack sucks and this is broken, but you never submitted your fix, right? So this thing is really important, right? I don't care how small it is. If it's a typo or whatever, you know, throw it up here, we'll fix it. And so uh, that's important to me, like, because I hate hearing people complain about something and I'm like, well, did you submit a bug fix? And they're like, well, no, I just fixed it myself. Well, that doesn't help anybody. The next big thing we added was the bleeding edge repository. So this was our answer to uh, tools like uh, set, for example, that Dave updates every day, <laughs> right? And so sometimes two or three times a day. So we needed an answer for this, right? Because there's nothing worse. This just happened to me recently. There's nothing worse than reading about a new exploit in Metasploit online getting to your job with no internet access and realizing that you forgot to update it before you left, right? So this was our answer to this. Let's, this is super experimental, right? This is an automated build process. So it's super experimental. Uh, it's gotten better than when we first put it out. But basically uh, what this does is this is an extra repository and these particular tools right here are automatically updated every single day. And so, uh, basically, it's still up to you to do the whole apt get update thing. Metasploit isn't listed here because they do that themselves, right? But it's uh, updated too. But SQL map's a big one, W3AF. Um, anyway, so uh, because this is experimental, it's not uh, in the default sources list. So basically, I don't know if you can see this. This stuff is all on the website too. This is nothing new or revolutionary. But like, uh, anyway, so. You just add the uh, bleeding edge repos to your installation and uh, you'll get those updates. Um, and we're gonna be adding more tools to this. This is just what we started with. We wanted to make sure it worked. We didn't want to add a million tools right away. There's probably about 10 more tools that I'd like to add to this, but so those are coming. 
The big thing is the ARM architecture. I don't know how many people do physical pen testing, social engineering, that kind of thing, but um, the days of carrying a giant 17-inch laptop, like sneaking in the door, you know, are over. Like, uh, everybody heard of the pawn plug? Couple people, okay, so the Palm Plug is an ARM-based device. Basically, the goal is to get the smallest device possible with the most processing power that you can hide on somebody's network and they can't see it, right? So, um, what we wanted to do is support as many of those devices as possible. So, um, what we also wanted to do, uh, so we bought the cluster, right? So that we could build our own ARM images. So like, and I'll show you in a second. So you could go to the website and select the ARM image, the device that you want to build it on and all that kind of stuff, and we'll build it for you. But the thing is, is that there's so many of these ARM devices, right? That it's kind of hard for us to uh, build on everything, right? We don't have people sending us Chromebooks and tablets and stuff all over the place. So we're limited by what we have and what we can afford. So. Another thing that we wanted was we wanted uh, to show people how to build a ARM cross-compiling environment on their computer and not actually need an ARM device for the uh, compiling process. So all of that is on our docs.cali.org site. So basically, you can get on your computer, you can set up an ARM build environment, you can download one of our images, you can uh, ch root into it, and then do whatever custom customizations you want to run it on whatever ARM architecture you want and build an image, and all of that is uh, documented on there. I was actually going to try to show some of that, but it would just take too long. But it's super cool if you're into ARM devices. Uh, some of the ones that we do support that we already have images uh, built on the website for are the Galaxy, the Chromebook, um, the Same Smart. I've never used that. The Odroid, which is my favorite piece of ARM equipment in the world, and I got a whole other slide about it because it's so awesome. And then the Raspberry Pi. Is that your Raspberry Pi? You're not going to want that anymore after you see the Odroid. Oh, I've, yeah, I've seen it. <laughs> <laughs> the price difference, though, is awesome. Yeah, well, yeah, the price difference. There's a little price difference. So this is the Odroid. I just want to feature this real quick because this thing is so awesome. Uh, the way this came about was that uh, uh, Eric and I did a physical pen test, and we have a lot of palm plugs. We love those guys. We support them. Great friends. Uh, the problem with the palm plug that we uh, found out was that when you plug it into a network with 26,000 hosts, it's a little bit difficult to do your pen test unless you know where everything is. So uh, we broke into a place, we set up a palm plug, you know, we threw that in there. Uh, once you put Metasploit and all that stuff on it, you're sort of limited on space after that. And so, like, there was a lot of um, uh, challenges with it. And so they're going a different, you know, they're putting out the poem pad and they have this new enterprise uh, system or whatever so they were going a little bit of a different direction and so Eric and I looked into researching other stuff and so uh, we looked into this Odroid thing and this thing is really small I mean like it's about this big the reason that we like it is that black part is uh, works as a heat sink but it's also the case and so you put some double sided sticky tape on that thing and stick it up under somebody's desk and they're never going to see it Again, I've got a, several of them in place currently uh, that haven't been found. And so <laughs> the other reason that we really like this thing is because it has a 1.7 gigahertz quad core processor. It can actually do some computations. And the other thing that we really like is it has two gigs of memory. I think even the biggest Raspberry Pi only has 512, right? And so we found that really limiting uh, for some tools. And the main reason is for an enterprise networks, right? Because uh, because you have to do discovery and nmap scans and all this kind of stuff and so uh, we were trying to scan slash 16s with our poem plug and it was taking an extremely long time and that uh, didn't really work for us so anyway I just wanted to feature that if anybody does this kind of pen testing this thing is freaking awesome it, doesn't have gigabit. it does not have gigabit that's its only downfall but it does have six USB ports and it will take a gigabit USB uh, to uh, Ethernet connect No, so it does require a power cable. Um, what I did to get over that, it does have a power cable that sticks in the side and I'm always paranoid about those falling out. So what I did was I soldered the power cables on. Because the thing is, is that the entire contraption costs like 150 bucks. But I mean, if you're on $50,000 engagements, I mean, who cares? You're gonna lose it anyway. So, uh, so I just rip all that off and I solder the power cable on there so there's no chance of it falling out. All right, so what else is new? Uh, these are just a couple of little things. I already talked about uh, the repository gets updated four times a day. 
the other thing is that the source and patches and every possible thing you could possibly want for every tool is available on Git. So if you have your own patch and you try to give it to us and we say that's nonsense, uh, you can just grab the tool and recompile it yourself and patch it, right? All, and, and a lot of this stuff is not revolutionary. It's just normal Linux, but it's not stuff that we were doing because uh, we never thought Backtrack would get as big as it was, right? We, we were just making something that was like cool uh, for us to use on engagements, right? And we had no idea that it was going to turn into what it did. And so we had to, like I said, like, uh, you know, get, get uh, some of our stuff back to regular Linux so that it made sense. There's another big reason for this is that um, another thing that we found is uh, one of the things on our wish list was that what, when I go on engagements, a lot of times uh, small to medium sized companies don't have their own security team. And, and they may have, you know, one or two guys that does security, but he always does something else and he doesn't have like a whole lot of time to devote, or he or she, I'm sorry, I'm being sexist, but anyway, so uh, they don't have a lot of time to devote to like building this, you know, really great, super good pen test distro because anybody that maintains their own stuff knows that there's a lot of work involved. So we wanted to make something that was uh, what we like to call enterprise ready. So like when you got the guy that's, the database administrator and he's also the uh, you know security guy and he's also the Twitter guy or something right and he doesn't have all this time he can just boot this up all the tools are where they supposed to be as long as he knows how to use Linux a little bit he'll be able to find all the tools he doesn't have to go what the hell is this pen test directory they've totally messed up Linux you know and so like uh, that's one of the things is that like it's it's a uh, it's more geared towards people that don't know pen testing, right? So we used to build backtrack for the, you know, for the hardcore pen testers and try to make it. Uh, but what we found is that like most super hardcore pen testers like to maintain their own image, right? So we wanted to make something that would help organizations just a little bit better, be easier to use, easier to implement. So one of the other reasons uh, we fixed the whole PXE boot with uh, pre-seed files, right? This is kind of minor, but if you have a gigantic uh, organization and you want to install Backtrack, like, you know, on every VLAN, for example, you know, whatever, you can do that now. And then the main thing was to seamlessly upgrade future major releases. So we don't want people to have to reinstall anymore, and the Debian architecture allows us to do that. So now we can push out new versions, new kernels, new everything. It comes down, it fixes, it works because all the files are in the right place. So people always ask me about this, new tool requests, right? So one of the things uh, it, that's really challenging about running something like this is uh, uh, weighing new tools versus size versus uh, does that really work? Traditionally in the past, you know, we would put the default tool for something, you know, like uh, DNS, like Dimitri or something like that's sort of a default DNS tool, right? But then we would have one of our friends call us and be like, dude, I just wrote the baddest new DNS tool. And you'd be like, oh, okay, we'll put that in there because we're friends or whatever. But then you end up with two, three, four, and five tools that all have the same functionality and you confuse people. And then what happens is like every class teaches a different tool or everybody uses a different tool and like it becomes a little bit skewed. And so we wanted to get away from that. So if you're making a new tool request, you know, is the tool useful in a pen testing function environment? We totally encourage people to do this because there's so many pen testing tools out there that there's no way the four or five of us or however small it is can keep up with it all, right? So like we rely on people to submit new tools. So is it functional in a penetration testing environment, right? That goes down to my fourth bullet point here. Um, tools that do DOS, DDOS, and anonymity like Tor, uh, all that kind of stuff. What we found is that I've never used any of that nonsense on a legitimate pen test, right? The people that ask for that type of stuff are probably doing something that they shouldn't be doing. So we decided not to include any of that kind of stuff, right? I, I, I've had like one legitimate use for Tor in years or whatever, but I figure if it comes to that, you can just install it yourself, right? So, uh, Basically, and then ask yourself, does the tool contain the functionality of other tools already? That's the main thing that happens is that, uh, you know, so-and-so writes a tool, so-and-so writes a tool, so-and-so writes a tool, then you get so-and-so steals all three of their code and writes their own tool, right, and releases it. Unfortunately, there's a lot of this type of stuff on the internet. So does it already 
do the functionality of an existing tool. And like I said, I'd rather have an existing tool that's been working for like 10 years than some brand new buggy bleeding edge, you know, Python script or whatever. So um, another big thing we want to look at is resources, right? Because we have these ARM devices, we don't want to put any big resource intensive tools that we don't need on Kali because we really want it to work from an ARM device. And then basically you can make these new tool requests on the bug website. There's a little drop down. You just say new tool request and uh, we'll review it. Um, I highly recommend trying to answer these questions in your actual uh, in your actual thing. And then most importantly, a link to the tool. Some people miss that part. <laughs> so uh, anyway, we got a pretty strong community. One of the things we revamped was the entire community. We got a new forms. Uh, we got a new IRC channel. Got a new Twitter. We're even on Facebook. <laughs> and uh, we got a blog, right? Uh, and so these are all the places that you can go to get official information. You definitely have to be careful because something that comes with being such a big popular distro is there's a lot of what I like to call biters. That's an 80s term. Anyway, so uh, there's a lot of people. So if you go out there, there's like CaliLinux.net, CaliLinux. You know, whatever Cali-Linux. So you have to be really careful that um, that you're at it that you're actually looking on like an official website. Now, whether those other guys' information, it's probably fine, I don't know, but take it with a grain of salt, right? We didn't write it, so uh, I don't know if it works or not. So uh, that was a big problem that we had with Backtrack was people would get unofficial information. Um, some of us are always in the IRC channel. Uh, you can always send us an email, uh, any of that kind of stuff, and, uh, and, and we're really trying to uh, answer all of those questions personally and that type of thing. So that's it. That's all I got. I know it wasn't technical. This is the first time I've ever given a non-technical presentation without demos and stuff. So it feels kind of weird, but does anybody have any questions I can answer? Yes. Yeah, if I set up a secure uh, Ozark module, it doesn't hack and doesn't have any issues with stressing, say, USB? No. What do you mean stressing USB? Because with Raspberry Pi, if you throw No, that's one of the reasons I like it is it comes pre-configured with six USB ports and it's uh, built to support them all. Okay, because I like Yeah, it's not like adding like a bunch of adapters with more USBs. Now, obviously, if you put like a big seven port USB hub on there, you might have some issues, but if you use the six that come on it, you should be fine. I've got one that's got a USB to ethernet, a or a GSM card and a wireless card all plugged into it and it's running fine right now, okay. currently. Well, it was this morning. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> could all go south while I'm talking, but any more questions? Yes. Uh, you said there's uh, improved support for the Ubuntu. Uh, yes. So, so basically the tools were not compiled. So stuff like Kismet had to be specifically compiled. And so I'll just be totally honest. When we were building all those tools, we forgot about the Ubertooth because me, honestly, I don't do a lot of Bluetooth pen testing. I, I don't. I, there may be like other people that do, but we just don't have a lot of call for it, right? I mean, like I've done some Bluetooth sniffing and like maybe got some Blackberry stuff, but they're over a lot of that, but we just don't have a call for it. I don't know if that's because it hasn't become a big attack surface yet or, so I forget about stuff like that. So as soon as we released the first image, we had a bunch of emails that were like, what about the Ubertooth support? And we're like, ah, uh. so uh, basically all it is is that we have better Bluetooth drivers on Debian and so, and then we also have the stuff is actually built to uh, work out of the box with the Ubertooth rather than recompiling it. Okay. Anybody else? Cool. Well, thanks everybody for uh, listening to me. I appreciate it.